Hello, thank you for tuning in. This is part one of the series in which we're going to be talking about well, my favorite video game franchise, and quite possibly the greatest video game franchise ever. This franchise single-handedly changed gaming as we know it. And for 30 years, every title has consistently raised the bar a little higher. I don't think you can name another franchise where there's the quality that is The Legend of Zelda. And for part one, we're going to be talking about the one that I all of The Legend of Zelda on the Nintendo Entertainment System. screen always brings back the best memories. The Legend of Zelda. I remember watching my dad play this when I was about oh, four or five years old or so, and he would go around finding all the secrets and hidden items and would show me what he knew. And those were the days, man, but eventually he'd go to work or give me control of the Nintendo, and it was my turn. My turn to transform into Link. My turn to decrypt these hints and However mistranslated or misspelled they might have been, I could find all of the secrets and I could beat all the monsters. And eventually exploring became second nature to me. It almost was like I was no longer playing Link, I was Link. And to this day, nothing feels better than going out on a journey to save Hyrule, one piece of the Triforce at a time. I feel like I should thank Shigeru Miyamoto. I know he'll never watch this video, but thank you, Miyamoto-san, for Mario, for Star Fox, for Donkey Kong, and of course, for Link, for The Legend of Zelda. I mean, who else could have thought of something like this? I mean, think about it. We're talking 1986. Everybody was coked out of their heads. People were listening to you 2 People were watching Knight Rider. Actually, Knight Rider was a cool show. People were wearing day glow and growing mullets. But think about this. There weren't any games like this in 1986. This wasn't Pac-Man, Donkey Kong. This wasn't Contra. This was the first game on a home console in which they gave you a world and they said, go young man. Go! From the beginning of the game, you can access almost every screen in the game. And oh, by the way, this place is riddled with monsters. You better find a weapon here pretty quick. Oh, by the way, you're gonna have to save your game. That's just another reason why this game is so revolutionary. Oh, you young kids out there probably don't know what I'm talking about. But this was the first game in America that wasn't on a computer that you could save. Not counting passwords, of course. But that was so cool. Mind-blowing, even. You had to go to school, you had to go to work, and yeah, no problem, just hit save and just go do your thing. Go to your job. Go to your job, come back and play some more Zelda. Huh? Oh, and the cartridge was gold. So yes, thank you, Miyamoto-san. Shigeru Miyamoto once told a story about how when he was a young boy, he would explore the hillsides and the forests around his childhood home in Sinobi, Japan. In these forests, he would find secluded lakes, caves, and even some small villages. One of his most memorable experiences was the day he discovered a cave entrance. He eventually entered the cave. He said that this was the moment he came up with the idea for The Legend of Zelda. The game was initially released for the Famicom or the Family Computer in Japan in 1986 for the Famicom Disk System. This allowed gamers to save their progress in the enormous game that was The Legend of Zelda. But when the game was finally ported to the Nintendo Entertainment System a year later, Nintendo had a problem on their hands. They had to figure out a way to save the game. So using a small coin battery, you could save your game in the SRAM of the cartridge even with the power turned off, which allowed for gamers to come back to the game later on. 
And the reason Nintendo was willing to do this was simple. It's the same reason they made the cartridge gold in the first place. Zelda was a huge hit in Japan, and Nintendo knew it was going to be a hit in the United States. So they decided to push the game with an aggressive marketing scheme, never mind the embarrassing rap commercial. Did you see the latest Nintendo newsletter? Whoa, nice graphics! I'd like to get my hands on that game! You mean you haven't played it yet? We can play it on my Nintendo Entertainment System. It's the Legend of Zelda and it's really rad. Those creatures from Ganon are pretty bad. Octoroks, Tech Tech's levers too. But with your help, our hero pulls through. Yeah, go Link, yeah, get some. Awesome! Intense. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Your parents help you hook it up. The Legend of Zelda sold separate. Think about it for one second. You didn't have games like this. Back in 1986, games didn't save. You had to use passwords. Games weren't so big you couldn't beat them in one sitting. You usually could. Or at least if you knew what to do, you could. This game, when it first came out, it was the talk of the playground at school. People would share rumors. Oh, you should try burning this bush or blowing up that wall. There was just a sense of adventure. And for years since, hundreds of times, people have tried to emulate it, and yet, it's still not Zelda. A long, long time ago, the world was in an age of chaos. In the midst of this chaos, in a little kingdom in the land of Hyrule, a legend was being handed down from generation to generation. The legend of the Triforce, golden triangles possessing mystical powers. One day, an evil army attacked this peaceful little kingdom and stole the Triforce of Power. This army was led by Ganon, the powerful Prince of Darkness who sought to plunge the world into fear and darkness under his rule. Fearing his wicked rule, Zelda, the princess of this kingdom, split up the Triforce of Wisdom into eight fragments and hid them throughout the realm to save the last remaining Triforce from the clutches of the evil Ganon. At the same time, she commanded her most trustworthy nursemaid, Impa, to secretly escape into the land and go find a man with enough courage to destroy the evil Ganon. Upon hearing this, Ganon grew angry and imprisoned the princess and sent out a party in search of Impa. Braving forests and mountains, Impa fled for her life from her pursuers. As she reached the very limit of her energy, she found herself surrounded by Ganon's evil henchmen. Cornered, what could she do? But wait, all was not lost. A young lad appeared. He skillfully drove off Ganon's henchmen and saved Impa from a fate worse than death. His name was Link. During his travels, he happened to cross Impa and Ganon's henchmen. Impa told Link the whole story of the Princess Zelda and the evil Ganon. Burning with a sense of justice, Link resolved to save Zelda, but Ganon was a powerful opponent. He held the Triforce of Power, and so in order to fight off Ganon, Link had to bring the sacred eight fragments of the Triforce of Wisdom together to rebuild the mystical triangles. If he couldn't do this, there would be no chance Link could fight his way into Death Mountain where Ganon lived. Relying on what Impa told him, Link had to make his way to Death Mountain. In the forest and mountains, there were several caves, and in these caves lived merchants that would sell Link useful items. He also stumbled across fairy springs. The fairies there rejuvenated Link and helped immensely on his quest. He had to brave underground labyrinths all over the place, some of which had entrances that were impossible to find. Luckily, he was able to find hints that helped him solve these riddles. Inside, he fought massive monsters and enemies, but he never faltered. He pushed through the mazes, avoiding enemies and finding treasures, and when he was trapped, he had no choice but to escape. Even when he was closed in on all sides, he never gave up. He pushed forward and eventually he was able to collect all eight pieces of the Triforce, battle Ganon, save Zelda, and the entire land of Hyrule. A lot of people complain that Zelda controlled too stiff. Oh, Link doesn't move diagonally. He only stabs straight forward. To those people, I say, well, give me one example before The Legend of Zelda that controlled differently, that had as much innovation. I mean, the NES controller was perfect for this type of game. You could move Link up, down, left, right. You could assign an item to the button. You could stab with A. It controlled pretty good. And it still controls pretty good to this day. Anybody can pick this game up and be decent at it. The challenge in Zelda is not because of the controls. If anything, I think the controls were a boon. That's the trademark of a Zelda game. The controls always fit like a glove. 
Sure, other Zelda games in the future would do better, but this was perfect for this type of game. But that wasn't the only good part about Zelda on the NES. The Legend of Zelda's graphics were outstanding for 1986, considering the scope of the game. With colorful, well-detailed sprites, varied environments, monsters that were well animated and were downright terrifying, great special effects, and a great assortment of environments to explore. From ocean sides, to forests, lakes in the forests, graveyards, deserts, dungeons of course, mountains, cliffs, and even the ocean itself. All explorable from a top-down perspective. There was no shortage of places to explore, and it gave the player a sense of immersion in a distant land, which had never been seen before, and it was enthralling. Now there is one criticism about The Legend of Zelda that I'll absolutely agree with. It's freaking hard, and it's very cryptic too. I've been playing the game since I was four years old, so nearly 30 years. So I've beaten this game so many times, I know where all the secrets are, and I know what bushes to burn and walls to blow up and so on and so forth. But can you imagine being a kid back in the late 80s playing this game with no player's guide, no internet, no game facts, walkthroughs, boards to go ask questions about? You were on your own. And considering the scope of this game, even to this day, if you don't know what to do, it'll take you hours to figure out where the next level is or the next heart container is. It's very cryptic too, kind of poor translation. It's very difficult to determine where to go next. But that kind of makes it great. It kind of makes it feel when you do discover something that you accomplish something. Games today hold gamers' hands too tight. This game, nothing like that. Said here, here's an overworld. Go have fun. Oh, and you had fun, all right. Take this dungeon entrance, for example. If you weren't lucky enough to go and talk to the lady who gives you hints for rupees, how the hell are you supposed to know to go up, and then go up again, and then go up again, and guess what? You're gonna go up again. Oh, there's a there's a dungeon there? Oh yeah, I knew that. That was easy. Come on now. Also, there was a lot of rooms in the game that were just unfair. Take this one, for example. The blue dark nuts are really hard to kill one on one. Try five on one with nowhere to hide. Oh, by the way, dark nuts, they're smart little bastards. They'll follow you and follow you and follow you and follow you. Or this room. Or this room. Yeah, it was a tough game, all right. But luckily, the game did give some hints. And sometimes they were very important and very critical to know. For example, if you didn't know that Dig Dogger was vulnerable to some type of sound in a dungeon where you just so happened to get the recorder, how are you supposed to beat this monster? But now that you know that, yes, he's as good as dead. So, despite its difficulty, it is the type of game that if you spend enough time and you amass enough clues, you can figure it out. Ah, sweet, sweet victory. Speaking of the items that Link used, with an inventory of items at Link's disposal, all of which had some sort of use, you were able to find the different secrets in the world and discover hidden objects. Those hidden objects all had some sort of purpose and would help Link to traverse the world with ease, allowing him to take shortcuts or find secret passageways. With all those items at his disposal, one has to wonder where he puts them all. Koji Kondo was the original composer of the Mario Brothers soundtrack. After the success of Super Mario Brothers on the Famicom, he was asked to make the soundtrack for The Legend of Zelda. Originally, he planned on using Maurice Ravel's Bolero, probably did not say that right, as the title theme, but when he found out it was still under copyright, he decided to compose a new arrangement, the Hyrule Overture. The Overture, which was used on the Overworld, as well as the Underworld theme, played in all of the different dungeons, are two of the most memorable music tracks ever made for a Zelda game, or frankly any video game at all. 
For the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to let this go and let you listen. Enjoy. Even though the game doesn't really hold up that well today, The Legend of Zelda is still a remarkable piece of video game history. With its mix of challenging puzzles and difficult dungeons, crazy boss fights, secrets to find, and gameplay that'll challenge even the best of reflexes, this is definitely a game I recommend to any gamers. But if you're a hardcore Zelda fan or retro gaming fan and you haven't played this game yet, I urge you to do so. You can't really go wrong with a game that changed gaming as we know it. If you're new to the Zelda franchise, it might be a frustrating game, sure, but you still owe it to yourself to experience the one that got it all started. It's available on the Wii U Virtual Console, the Wii Virtual Console, and also the 3DS Virtual Console, and of course, the original Nintendo Entertainment System. So in closing, I do think it's not perfect, and it doesn't hold up as well as some of the other titles in the series, but I don't think there's much argument here. This game is still great, and it single-handedly changed video gaming as we know it. You owe a lot 
about what you know about gaming to this little gold cartridge, this iconic cartridge, quite possibly the most iconic cartridge on the most iconic system ever created. Thank you for tuning in. Step in for part two when we talk about its sequel, The Legend of Zelda 2, The Adventure Link. Till then, I'm JSR. Make sure you hold reset down when you turn the power off, else you might lose your same thing. Take care.